Welcome everybody to this webinar um, presented by the QLOC Staffing Issues Working Party um, and we've got some people here. Welcome to our presenters who are going to talk to us about the um, activities that they attended through the PD scholarship that QLOC awarded during 2017. So our first speaker up today is Maureen Bazanson from Southern Cross University. Over to you Maureen. Hello, Maureen. Thank you, Alison. I'm on a laptop and suddenly getting nervous and my fingers are sweaty. Just a minute, let me get this up. There we go. I should have got a real mouse apparently. Sorry about that. Hello. My name is Maureen Bazanson and I'm with Southern Cross University. And this year I was honored to be able to attend the International Indigenous Librarians Forum in February. Um, now this forum, is something that I wanted to go to because I've been working with the Guinea Bee College of Indigenous Australian people here at SCU for almost three years and very early on in my role I realized that my work actually won't be done with the college until there is an Indigenous librarian in that role. So I've been doing myself to doing the best to educate myself, increase my cultural competency, and take a look at what's happening across the library and education sector as a whole with regards to Indigenous support. When I first started doing this research, I found the Indigenous Librarians Forum that was being held in Canada in 2015. And as much as I wanted to go home, I figured as a casual, brand new in the role, really was too much to ask for. So I waited until 2017. Now, this forum, is something that's held every other year and the purpose of it is to foster exploration of significant issues facing libraries and institutions that care for indigenous and cultural information. So that's a pretty big gamut of things to, to cover and this particular ILF, I'll just refer to it as ILF for simplicity, this particular one was held at the State Library of New South Wales and had people from New Zealand, Australia, Canada and the US Unfortunately, we had two presenters that were planning on attending from, I believe it was Tanzania, but they had to pull out at the last minute due to funding. The theme for this session was knowledge connections, survival and activism. So fairly broad, but a lot of those issues came up through the forum and I'll speak on some of them. Now I wanted to start with my personal takeaways. Uh, anyone who has worked with me in the past knows that if there isn't anything if it's not personal. Um, I wear my heart on my sleeve and you always know what I'm thinking about something. And when planning this presentation, I actually watched You Got Mail for the first time in 10 years or something. And there was a quote in there that was, whatever anything else is, it ought to begin by being personal. That's my own particular moral, I guess, when working, but I think that also really applies to Indigenous knowledge and working with Indigenous peoples. It is personal, it's not business. So I was really honored to be welcome and accepted by this group. Um, part of me felt like I shouldn't be there, that I didn't belong because I'm non-Indigenous, but not a single person made me feel like that. I think it was actually a case of me feeling like a minority for one of the rare occasions of my life, which was a really good experience. Um, because it wasn't a large conference, there wasn't a trade show component with swag and giveaways, but the concept of gifting did come up. And I was given this bracelet that you can see here by um, an activist, sorry, an archivist artist from Melbourne. And she had brought a few of these to give away from their um, prints on kangaroo skin to, to people who she met at the conference. A few other people had, had brought things to give away, posters, prints, etc. Um, now things people didn't give things to everyone, but it was it was, I guess, part of part of the cultural experience was the idea of presenting gifts from where you're from. Something that I definitely think about in the future. Uh, it came up in one of the sessions that the protocols of a community are an important part when doing research with a community. And one of the people who spoke to us talked about when he was doing research in Canada and was given tobacco and blankets while doing his research. And 
when he first was given those, he rejected them because, well, he didn't need the blanket and he didn't need, didn't smoke. Then realized that actually that was an insult because gifting was part of the protocols. Big personal takeaway. What is my motivation for what I'm doing? And as much as I try to take my ego out of the picture and leave it at the door, it's still there and I need to be cognizant that my relationship is built on trust and not for my professional gain. Professional takeaways. Indigenous librarianship is more than just a job. It's more than just serving an Indigenous community. Often it is um, an Indigenous person serving a role in a library and not just in a library but in higher education and probably in, in all aspects of life. The Indigenous person ends up having to play multiple role, roles has that um, additional work of being the person that everyone goes to when there's a question about, ooh, what am I supposed to say in this particular situation? Who should I contact to find out in community that it's not necessarily their role as a librarian, but because they are Indigenous, they're expected to know and do so much more. And so that's why I've just got, hello, I'm an expert. I don't have that. My role working with the Indigenous community and non-Indigenous, I don't have that additional load that an Indigenous person working in a library would have. Partnerships. Um, we need to, it's built on trust. We need to be consistent in working with Indigenous communities for everything that we do. There is no exception to that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the biggest professional takeaway for me was, why was I the only person from any university in Australia at this event? It was the first time it was offered in Australia in 10 years. There were people from universities in three different countries in the world, but the representatives from Australian institutions were state libraries, public library, and archives, not university libraries, with the exception of me. But I've got no ego there, reminder. <laughs> so the applications that I found coming out of the presentations that I saw were, well, just being aware of the resources that there are out there to support the students. Um, I learned about a lot of great work that's being done by the State Library of New South Wales and by the National Library. They have a ton of guides available that I'm not aware of because it's a matter of browsing their sites. As often open resources that are created, we just need to stumble across. So it was really good to find out what, was aware, what is out there now. Case in point, I found out that one of the Lib guides that the National Library was working on was to do with the 1967 referendum. They were creating a new guide that was going to be released this year for the anniversary. Because I knew it was coming, I was able to pop that in and put that in my guide right away. Collaborate. Collaborators, the importance of collaborating with people and meeting other librarians who I could collaborate with as well. Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. When we look at intellectual property, we need to look at indigenous cultural intellectual pro property through a different lens. And Terry Janke came to talk to us about this and gave us a lot of really interesting insights about this. And I highly recommend looking up Terry Janke's work if you want to know a bit more about how can we look at cultural intellectual property? How is that different? Um, it is different from a United Nations Declaration on, United, on the Rights of Indigenous People perspective. However, it does not translate into the laws of our country. So it's something that she works from a legal, legal perspective on. From our library's perspective, one of the ideas that was discussed from a library in New Zealand was how they incorporated traditional Maori culture into their orientation. And that's got me thinking about how I could work with the Indigenous Australian Student Services here and do some sort of joint orientation with the library. Um, cultural safety, we've been going through some work already at the library to put some cultural safety protocols in place for our particular library space. And promoting and advertising with intent, what I mean by that is we try to employ Indigenous people, but at the same time, in a recent advertising campaign that we did to try and recruit rovers, we advertised through the Student Association. We didn't advertise through the Student Association and the Indigenous Australian Student Association. So we just did the overall blanket one. And there's, there's an equality equity argument there. 
you need to, uh, we need to think about where how we can target our our advertising to get the people that we want into the library both as employees and as staff or, and as students QLOC there's an indigenous st strategy reference group that's come out of okay probably not just come out of my my forum visit but hey I suggested it in my my results to QLOC so there you go I'll take a little bit of credit there's that ego again and I think that QLOC needs to think about its influence within the greater industry and looking at the work that the National Library has been doing with um, Indigenous internships and is there anything further that we could do to help promote employment of Indigenous people within the library sector. These are my daughter's handprints that she did at preschool last year and for me they're sitting on my desk as my constant reminder that it's my own personal reconciliation action plan that heart in the middle isn't quite complete and I need to do work internally and externally to heal that. Oh, sorry. Lastly, the 20th anniversary ILF is going to be in New Zealand in Aratora in two years time and I would strongly recommend that someone, lots of us, um, any Indigenous staff that we have are encouraged to, to attend. The protocols for the ILF vary depending on where where it is being held and the beliefs of the peoples of the land so when i was doing attending this in australia there was no problem with me being present for the whole thing however when it's held in new zealand there are portions of the forum that are specifically for indigenous people and that is just part of how the forum works and something that we need to be respectful of and understanding of oh, any questions <laughs> Actually, we run a bit over time, Maureen. I'm sorry. So I'll, no questions. I will move on to Megan. Thank you. And um, I'll ask people if they've got questions just to hold them over. And if we've got time, time left at the end, they can ask them then. And if not, they can get in touch with you, I'm sure. So our next speaker is Megan Gribble um, from the University of the Sunshine Coast. And yes, so over to you, Megan. Hello. Can you see my screen? Yes, we yeah, Okay, great. Just wanted to check. I've got a few desktops yeah. here. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name's Megan, and I'm going to share with you today how I use my QLOC um, scholarship. So, I used it to contribute to a registration at Alia Information Online. The conference was held in Sydney from the 14th to the 16th of February. And why did I choose Alia Online? Uh, I selected the event as I had never attended um, a major conference before and I wanted to engage with the people and practices across the industry. Most of the timetable and keynote speakers were published and I saw lots of sessions and speakers that intrigued me. And of course, it was a networking opportunity to meet with colleagues, exhibitors, vendors, new people and hear from different institutions. So the industry insights that I um, gained from the conference were library narratives, user experience, and prototypes. So firstly, Patricia McMillan, the author of Make It Matter, The Surprising Secret for Leading Digital Transformation. Her keynote address really talked about the structure and features of a good narrative and how we can use that to think about the story that libraries project. So how do characters, stakes, leaps, setbacks, and allies in library organisations intertwined to tell institutional stories as well as the industry's collective library story. So we, we think of Queensland University Libraries, then our story is powerfully influenced by membership with QLOC, how we make leaps forward together, how we have opportunities like this to share with colleagues and connect across institutions, creating allies. So a lot of emphasis by Patricia was placed on the importance of the lesson or gift that can be taken away from the story and it was really an engaging talk and a unique way to consider how the library industry and individual workplaces can be considered through a story. And there were a couple of other universities that elaborated on that um, by using um, stories to engage patrons in escape room style games as an orientation activity or how um, in peer support groups, um, colleagues were encouraged to share their own personal stories. 
The second industry insight was user experience, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to many people. Um, and it was a common theme that was threaded throughout. So it was about understanding how we need to understand users' expectations and like any business, quickly engage with them to address their needs. Um, so library personalization is essential to a library sustainability. So it prompts thinking about what are libraries doing to personalize resources and services. And we've got Amazon, Google, Netflix, they're all tailoring an experience around what they know about our users and our users are in that environment and coming to us. So some radical conference suggestions included drones for interlibrary loan or a library that automatically checks out your book when you walk out the door. Um, and finally, the key, another key trend at the conference was the use of prototypes in a range of different institutions. So the State Library of New South Wales presented on at the DX lab they have there, and it utilises technology to deliver innovative exploratory tools for library collections. Um, and they really discuss the importance of sharing with the audience that this is an experimental phase, this is a prototype, and then this method offers vital feedback about the product or service, and then they can use that to inform decisions. And um, Doc1, Rolf um, Hapwell from Doc1 in Denmark, which was the public library of the year in 2016, he also shared that the use of prototypes is critical to get to gain understanding during a development phase and something they used when developing their library. Um, so as an industry, we need to understand that new concepts don't have to be perfect when offered. Instead, it is beneficial to include prototypes as part of a feedback loop that can positively influence design. Um, so if we have then a look at the transferable lessons, what I took back to my workplace, so I already mentioned the theme of user experience um, and several of the sessions at Alia, not just um, keynote speakers, but a lot of the practical sessions um, had examples of the processes workplaces were undertaking to redesign and, and enhance their user experience. So for example, Melbourne University presented on developing specialised interactive websites and UTS outlined how they developed content for online learning modules to teach digital literacy. And so the presentations provided practical advice, such as software limitations, browsers, um, considerations, style guides. And this was really valuable information because it offers the opportunity to learn from others' experience, their successes, their mistakes. Um, and in another session coordinated by EBSCO, the need to observe, listen and watch clients to understand what they actually do as opposed to what they say they do was really emphasised and you can see that there in my image. So I've been able to transfer this knowledge into a very recent usability project at USC with a new interface update to Exlibris's Primo, which is our discovery layer. We wanted to learn about Primo's usability in relation to concepts like navigation, design, functionality, and performance. So recently we've conducted both an online survey and usability testing with the new Primo interface. Um, to evaluate and maximise the ease of use. And we plan to roll that out in early 2018. And from these sessions, we've been able to identify minor and major issues, which we're in the process of sharing across teams to decide on recommendations for implementation. But at the beginning of the project, I was able to review the user experience sessions I had attended at Alia. Um, and my notes had some really useful tips and insights to consider how to coordinate the project, how others had conducted usability or user experience sessions. Um, and it was a good starting place to get the project going. Um, then my personal games, my professional games. Um, James Neal from Columbia University, he opened the conference with his keynote address on the 21st century information professional. And he highlighted the constant changing and sometimes chaotic landscape, which we're all familiar with. And James challenged participants to be the source of solutions. Um, and he gave this anecdotal story on when he interviews potential employees, he asks them after this job, what's the next job you're going to apply for? And I really found that an interesting question and it made me ponder um, what would my own answer be and how do I need to develop the skills in order to progress towards that goal. 
Um, in addition, um, there was some a speaker, Jane King from the ATO, um, who talked about organisational culture. And at the time of the conference, um, my workplace had just begun the process of a staffing realignment. So I found her speak on organisational culture and agility very timely. She discussed things like transformational leadership, cultural traits, change management. It was really a highly engaging talk. Um, and she talked about how the ATO undertook a very large internal cultural shift that transformed taxpayers to clients. And some of the techniques she emphasised were in-house videos to deliver messages, staff outlining consequences, as well as rewards and more flexible teams to reduce management hierarchy. Jane ultimately insisted culture cannot be changed overnight and urged the audience to view change as a privilege and not a burden. And this is one of the key mindsets I took home from the conference. And I have to confess, and I do apologise to Jane, but I wasn't overly excited to attend this keynote. When I saw the ATO, I thought, oh dear, tax department, what's this going to be like? But I was very presently surprised and this session came to be one of the most memorable for me. So there was a lesson there too. Sometimes the unexpected conference presentation can surprise you. And finally, of course, aside from the keynote and concurrent sessions, I benefited from meeting new professionals and networking with my peers to informally discuss working within the information sector. Um, you may have seen throughout my slide, there were some Twitters, some tweets, sorry. So I used um, Twitter to share about the conference, um, which enabled networking both with colleagues at the conference and those that weren't able to attend. The exhibitor hall offered the chance to learn about new products and browsing and vendors and I was able to speak to some of our content providers about usage and updates on content and packages. Um, there was also sponsored industry events and the conference dinner, opportunities to meet new people, learn about their institutions or their roles. And I was also able to fit in a quick trip before the airport to the Think Space at Sydney Uni and see for myself the setup and technology that had been discussed at the presentation, at the conference, sorry. So through my attendance at ALIA, I was able to gather with lots of like-minded people, exchange lots of ideas, hear from other perspectives. Um, I really enjoyed myself. It was a big few days. Um, and so I encourage you, if there is a professional development opportunity you've been eyeing off, then I encourage you to think about the QLOC scholarship. Any questions? Thanks, Megan. I think we do need to keep moving. Um, if people want to ask questions, they might like to use the chat box <coughs> things through, um, uh, whether that's to the whole panel or just to individuals. Um, our next speaker is Nerida Cordemas from QUT. So thanks, Nerida. Thanks, Alison. I'm just going to start my presentation. Can you all see that now? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about my attendance at the Creative Commons 2017 Global Summit uh, in Toronto, Canada in April this year. So just by way of background, um, since 2014, it's been part of my copy of copyright officer role at QUT to also be a member of the Creative Commons Australia project team uh, at QUT through our institutional affiliation um, with Creative Commons. And in that uh, small amount of time um, that I give to Creative Commons, um, you know, I perform a number of roles. Um, outreach, mainly through our university library and copyright networks, also providing um, an information service to the community, um, communicating on social media, uh, providing resources for Creative Commons users um, and in generally promoting and sharing, which is the, the whole mission of the Creative Commons organisation. But beyond this sort of formal relationship that QUT has with Creative Commons and, um, you know, what we know about using Creative Commons licences, um, 
you know, it, I've always been a bit limited in my view of Creative Commons. I could see it from that sort of perspective. Um, but I'd heard a lot about the summits and my project lead here at QUT, Nick Souza, had suggested I make it um, a public, a, a, a PD aspiration. So 2017 seemed like an important year to attend the summit because Creative Commons as an organ organisation is going through a lot of structural change. Um, also Nick and Jessica from QUT were actually going and presenting and although I didn't aspire to present there, I really felt it would be um, a great team outcome if we all managed to be there this year. So I made an application for um, a QLOC scholarship because um, this was an international conference. So my attendance costs came out to about $4,000. So being able to get a um, $1,000 scholarship from QLOC was a really significant um, input and enabler for me to be able to attend. And that's an interesting thing as well. When you're looking at um, attending something like an international conference, the cost is high. Um, and so from a number of sources, I was able to put together um, enough to make it to the conference, which was just fantastic. So um, the summit, again, I used to think, oh, is this for the organisation is sort of like um, a, a meeting of the organisational of the uh, organisation and its members, but it's it's huge. It's much bigger than that, um, and it's an event for keynotes and workshops um, on developments in open. Uh, its focus is on all aspects of open work, so not just as we see it perhaps um, in the landscape of libraries and universities, but it was all about um, education, free culture, open data and research, open knowledge. Um, the summit is also about facilitating collaboration, both inside the organisation and outside. And in 2017, as I referred to before, um, it was an event for un unveiling this new strategic plan for our global network of Creative Commons members. The program was organised into streams and that was a really helpful uh, thing to be able to look at in the lead up to the conference. Um, so um, there were streams like community and commons development, um, policy and advocacy, all the different spheres that are open. Um, and the conference used a program planning app called SHED and you can see um, one day of my conference attendance mapped out on SHED and that was a fantastic tool. So if you were involved in conference organising, I would highly recommend that. Um, it's quite dynamic so the conference can communicate with you if there are changes. You can make changes when you're looking at quite a busy and multi-streamed conference. You know, you can add yourself to these events and then you get a nice graphical layout. So not only was that great for me attending and to be able to plan my attendance before I got there to make the most of the time, um, but uh, also if you're involved in organising, then I think it's a great idea. So there I was um, in Toronto. My takeaways, apart from my really heavy luggage, which you can see um, a hint of on the left there, huge pers personal takeaways. Um, the summit made a really big impact on me. Before the, the summit, I was a bit, you know, it's CC, it's about the licenses. Um, but in fact, at the summit, you see really inspiring examples of the benefit of using Creative Commons licenses, how we can open our collections, how we can disseminate our scholarly outputs. And then away from that, just content sharing platforms, knowing about what's happening out there. Um, but particularly for me, now that I have met Creative Commons face to face, instead of just um, 
sometimes online or as um, a licensed concept. It's more about the people. And that brings me to the man in the photo, and that's Basil Cardival. Um, at the summit, Ryan Merkley, who's the CC CEO, unveiled a 3D printed model of a tetrapylon from the ancient Syrian city of Palmyria. And it was an homage to Basil Cardibal. Basil was the Creative Commons Syria project lead. He started the cultural preservation project called Hash New Palmyria. Which, fe which featured open source 3D virtual remodeling of the architecture of this ancient city in Syria. In 2012, Basil was taken and detained by the Syrian government. He went completely off the radar in 2015, and there was no word of him until August this year, when it was confirmed that he had been executed in 2015. And although this is an awful and extreme example of what happens um, in a regime such as Syria is experiencing, Basel was the perfect illustration um, of commitment um, to a cause. And Ryan, the CEO, uh, when he was talking about Basel's project, talked about the needing for an organisation to show gratitude. And this really had a huge impact upon me. And the idea of building a culture of appreciation within a network, they tend not to be the sort of highly subjective things that we would, have, we would subscribe to in our work, but um, it was a perfect sort of eloquent and appropriate um, realisation um, for me, and apart from Basil's inspirational life, the Creative Commons organisation is made up of really inspirational people. And if you're interested in seeing examples of that, um, there's um, women of the commons. You can Google all of these things. Made with CC, which are the books that I brought home in my luggage that show projects that are working in the open. Um, faces of the common, which reveals who the members of Creative Commons are. And one of the other personal realisations that comes very much to that was it never struck me before that Creative Commons is biased towards English speaking countries. And this creates incredibly um, complex challenges for non-English speaking countries. And often these countries are also challenged in terms of um, you know, government uh, and uh, funding. But when I attended the workshops, it was apparent to me that these people from these countries were at the summit and they were showing the most extraordinary examples of projects that they were doing that were socially very important. Um, in their country, um, and they really epitomise the big work that the Creative Commons organisation is doing, not the sort of work um, that I do. So, you know, that it was personally both confronting and really inspirational. One of the keynote speakers was a woman called Hilary Hartley, who's Ontario's um, Chief Digital Officer. And you know that says a lot about um, Canada as a country as well, that the government has a, a CDO. But Hillary said, be the change, lead by example. And, and that was a great personal takeaway. Professionally though, there were librarians everywhere. And again, it's what your pre-thought about a conference is and then what it turns out to be. Many librarians um, from many sectors of library organisations um, there were great sessions led by um, libraries and museums talking about um, open digital practices. Um, there were also university libraries there and we talked about the huge expenditure. I think it's about $30 billion a year on content licenses and how we should seek open solutions and alternatives. Um, in addition to that, there were um, topic-based areas of focus in Creative 
Commons and I did attend some of the advocacy and policy development sessions because um, you know that's an area if we're going to be um, advocating for open we need to understand how to develop policy and how to advocate for things so um, professionally I really benefited from sitting in on on those sessions as well copyright law reform is one of the platforms for creative commons um, there's global action on copyright reform for education Delia Brown who's the head of the National Copyright Unit for the Department of Education spoke um, and she highlighted that um, in Australia under the current statutory licensing scheme we pay more than anybody else in the world to provide content for Australia so um, listening to deal your talk was um, informative um, and inspirational for me there was also um, a lot of focus on open education resources and you know it just confirmed to me that oer are the next big thing and we do need to get on board in libraries and at universities there's a growing body of research that was discussed that that points to the benefits of OER for teaching and learning outcomes. There were sessions on free and open textbooks, and I think in Australia, we're just starting to get our heads uh, around that. Um, yeah, so a number of things. My colleagues at QUT, um, particularly, particularly Jessica Stevens, is working on uh, OER and um, you know she's becoming an Australian expert um, and researcher on OER so it was great to hear from her and to know that she's not only a member of my own university but she's um, in our network um, and is um, able to um, help us as we grapple with the challenges of OER So for me professionally, um, where to from here? I participated in, in Creative Commons globally in a way that I've never been able to before or it opened the door for me to think about participating globally in the network, not just locally in my community. So um, there are platforms of focus that are developing at Creative Commons and I've joined two of those. One is for galleries, libraries, archives, museums, um, the GLAM sector. And I've actually started collaborating. Um, I've been working with someone from Creative Commons in Argentina, which is just so exciting to be able to do. Um, I also uh, made better friends um, with our um, New Zealand counterparts, Creative Commons Aotearoa, and since I came back from um, the summit, I co-presented with Mandy Henk from CC New Zealand at an AOASG webinar. So it's really opened up my professional horizon, um, which has been really satisfying to do. Uh, I'll continue to apply my knowledge in my daily work so CC licenses as they enable open access, open data, OER. Um, I'll continue to talk about copyright and open licensing issues that are relevant to us um, in the university information policy and service area. Um, I'm determined to learn to advocate more for the creation of OER, both at my institution um, and outside of it. I'll continue doing um, the usual information, um, sharing things that I do through Creative Commons uh, at QUT, including um, in QLOC, where I belong to the Copyright Practitioners Group, uh, and also in the University Copyright Network. Um, one exciting thing is that in January I'm going to participate in a pilot program for Creative Commons certification, um, which is an opportunity to actually um, complete an online course that leads to a certificate um, that speaks to your expertise in Creative Commons. And that's something that we might be able to look at going forward um, for um, us to offer uh, training uh, for librarians who are interested in some level of certification or training in Creative Commons. So um, that's something to look forward to 
um, as well. And the heavy luggage, well, I brought back seven copies of this um, Creative Commons book called Made with Creative Commons. And I actually um, distributed, distributed it um, to my own library, but also our state library, um, our national library, and to QLOC. And it was really um, thrilling to see copies of it actually land um, in libraries. So that was a nice takeaway um, and helps towards the application and people's understanding of what Creative Commons achieved. Yeah, so thanks very much for listening to me. Thanks, Nerida. We'll, we'll keep moving. Um, and next up we have Maria Larkin from UQ. Um, we are going to run over time, so I'll just let people know if you're in the audience and listening, um, and, but you have to leave, don't panic. This is being recorded so you can catch up on it later. So um, thanks, Maria. Over to you. Are you there, Maria? Yes, I'm here. Just... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maria Larkin. I work in client services at the University of Queensland at Gatton Campus. Um, the QLOC scholarship has a distinct advantage of being flexible enough to meet your own particular PD needs, whatever you perceive that to be. At this early stage of my library career, attending the New Librarian Symposium was a priority for me. It's a biannual event held every second year since its inception in 2002 and is squarely aimed at new career librarians. This year was the eighth symposium and it was held at the National Library of Australia in Canberra. There were more than 50 presentations, workshops and site tours with the overarching theme of do-it-yourself library career. Um, this was an event I had in my sights and the scholarship made it possible for me as the quite significant attendance fee and the airfares were covered by the scholarship. The presenters range from first timers to seasoned professionals in the field, sharing their knowledge and experiences and friendship in Australia and beyond. It was particularly encouraging to see many first time presenters were braving the podium and the crowd was positive, supportive and the 200 plus delegates were very encouraging of these first time presenters. The first day started the first day started with a bus tour of three distinctly different sites. First, we visited the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Library. This complex holds the world's most comprehensive collection of prints, moving images, sound recordings and photographic materials relating to our cultures and histories with a specialised native title research unit and an Indigenous Family History Research Service. Next to the National Film and Sound Archives, where there are currently 2.3 million items collected for preservation and sharing. And the last stop was a visit to the Civic Branch of ACT Public Libraries, where the collections and services are focused on the clientele of mostly professional city-based workers. I have to share with you an overview of eight of the many sessions I attended, so varied in content and areas of interest. The first afternoon was taken up by an extended workshop held at the NLA and hosted by Catherine Unsworth and Natasha Simons of the ANDS, Monash University and Griffith University. It was interesting to learn of the skills required and the training opportunities available for academic librarians to develop their own data literacy. The presenters spoke of the emerging need for research team librarians to manage data from the onset of a research project providing new opportunities for career building in our profession. Being reminded that as librarians, we are already skilled in research and know how and where to locate knowledge within the university structure, undertaking a practical team exercise to reinforce this. The challenges librarians face is to upskill and become the guide. The emphasis here is that you do not have to be a data genius. It was great to have this area of data management demystified and have the opportunity to discuss potential opportunities for training and employment in Australia. The next two days were busy with presentations and seminars that covered so many different aspects of librarianship and careers. Choosing what to attend was the hardest part, but I decided that rather than be strategic, I would attend whatever interested me so as to be exposed to a broad range of knowledge and perspectives. 
Here's a few examples. The International Librarians Network was started by three friends with an idea and grew to be an independent global peer mentoring network. Their advice was to new career librarians was simply self-fund your career, go to the international conferences, engage with webinars, Skype conferences, be the next person on the career path. A knowledge management building presentation by Eleanor Collar and Claire O'Hanlon was an informational discussion about their experiences of building communities of information practice in their own area of interest. This was a way of putting their skills, organisational and individual knowledge into practice in a voluntary space, thus creating their own experiences and building communities with the aid of online collaborative tools. They shared their experience and found that rotating responsibilities increased buy-in and in response to the varying work commitments and individual respons responsibilities of the members. They managed to change rostered meeting days, keeping a regular time and including everyone at some time and their key to success was always food as it is a voluntary club. Another presentation was by the University of Technology Sydney's Library Engagement Gang. This was great telling us about how the group of five librarians were responsible for creating social media content, hosting library space activities, creating book displays for significant events and dates and weekly movie screenings. They endeavoured for one of them to be present at non-library events to create student engagement within the university, in and out of the library spaces. The main points being, get out of the library and onto the campus. Listen to people's needs. What is student fun, not librarian fun? <laughs> and measure your success. Keep it simple. Spreadsheets on the internet with event information, attendance stats, where it met KPIs, and always have a post-event debrief and add these comments to ensure events can be modified and adjusted for next time. I really enjoyed this presentation. With our services becoming somewhat behind the scenes, the UTS gang were taking an alternative perspective and proactively building library client relationships. One of our keynote speakers was Miley Joseph from the State Library of New South Wales. Miley shared her knowledge and extensive experience with us and I found her advice can be applied to our profession in any situation. Forget the culture of perfect, that is the enemy of timeliness and cooperation. Getting things done just in time is fine. Then you have no time to stress, no time to brood, and as you are not aiming for perfection, but growth. Within your community, ask what problems do you have and think, how can the library position itself to assist? Learning from her extensive experience was invaluable. Another keynote presenter was David Lanks, author of the new Librarianship Field Guide. He presented via Scatterlight from South Carolina, USA. He shared his thoughts of the changes within our profession and encouraged us to take a new view of ourselves as we need to be wary of the dangers of nostalgia that everyone holds about libraries. So many people still define libraries as a quiet book place. And often these memories were made when they were a child. And that is sometimes the last time that person interacted with a library. David believes that we need to recognise who we serve, our own particular community, and strive to improve that community, capture our own unique stories, and endeavour to create connections. And one thing he said, stop and listen. Another varied presentation was from Hong Kong Libraries Connect. It was a community of practice established in Hong Kong with two newly qualified librarians, Chris Chan and Joanna Hare. They decided to set up a group to create a support community for library students and workers in the Hong Kong area. Using free online tools and an inclusive non-hierarchical structure, they shared their library experiences and learning. They've had success with innovative programs, such as establishing a mentoring program with a speed dating type of event and including their effective practices online. As the new librarians noted, the pre-existing library culture in Hong Kong is deeply conservative and traditional. And so the group was a great example of creating opportunities and their own professional networks and communities. I caught Sam Searle's presentation. She spoke of considering that librarians working in an environment of continual change can equip themselves with IT skill sets that are relevant to future careers. 
we were introduced to the skills framework for the information age an IT competency framework used in over 200 countries there are 97 skills in the framework Sam wanted us to understand that there is so much more available to us than just coding and identified three core skills that could apply to our career in libraries user experience evaluation change management and business process improvement all relevant to our work environments Sam encouraged us to self-assess, decide what your interests and career thoughts are, and if it looks towards IT, plan and move towards your goal. Our final speaker was Jane Caro, and although her profession lies outside of the library sphere, her words resonated with the predominantly female audience. She didn't present the usual inspirational or motivational speech, believing that we new career professionals who choose to spend a Sunday in Canberra in June for work purposes, we are motivated enough. Her thought of being a woman in the professional world over the last 40 years gave us all a background to the challenges women face today. Jane relayed that she had always been told that she was too loud, too pushy, just too much. And it took her a long time to push back and question who decides what's too much and who decides what's too little. She learned that you do not let others decide what's correct for you. Do not let others acclaim power and rights over you that they do not have. Her words spoke of knowing your own self-worth and character and value that to bring your unique self to your work and your career path. She was the perfect conclusion to the symposium. At this early stage of my library career, attending the new librarian symposium was a great learning experience for me. I was able to dip into and explore facets of the profession outside of my own workspace arena. I met both new career and experienced librarians from across the country and the world in a friendly environment. And I learned a lot more about myself, where my strengths lie, what does and doesn't engage me, and what direction I want to be heading. Attending the symposium gave me the opportunity to build my own skills by giving a presentation to my work group, writing for the University Library staff newsletter and participating in this, my first online webinar presentation. I'd encourage anyone to think about what professional development you feel you need at this stage and consider applying for a QLUC scholarship. I highly recommend attending a symposium or conference. It's a great way to reconnect, re-energize and commit to your profession. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Our penultimate speaker is David Honeyman from Bond. So David, you have the floor. Okay, I'm just sharing my screen. Got it. Okay, great, fantastic. Okay, uh, um, I'll try and go a little bit quicker um, and maybe not the full 10 minutes. Uh, so my name's David Honeyman. I work at Bond University as the faculty librarian uh, for the Faculty of Health Sciences and Medicine. Uh, so I'm a health librarian here at Bond. And I was uh, very lucky to get the QLOC scholarship, which enabled me to uh, travel right over to the other side of the country, to Perth, uh, for the Health Libraries Australia Professional Development ED Days. Uh, this is a picture I took. Um, of sunny Perth, um, wasn't quite the same as the Gold Coast, but actually had kind of a, a, a brooding beauty there. Uh, the workshop that I attended was held at Curtin University and in the new building for their, their medical program. Uh, so that was interesting as well. I, I made sure I had a good look around uh, their new facilities for their, for their new medicine students there, but but that's where we were. Uh, there's some pictures here of the inside of the workshops. Essentially, it was two days of presentations targeted at health librarians. And uh, if any of you out there are health librarians, uh, you, you probably know that a, a big um, uh, theme or area for us at the moment is systematic reviews. Um, uh, a majority of the presentations at the workshop uh, were around systematic reviews in some way. 
Uh, in fact, one of the presenters even felt the need to kind of put in a humorous disclaimer. Uh, this My presentation had nothing to do with systematic review, uh, but it was systematic reviews, systematic reviews, systematic reviews. Um, whether that was, you know, uh, the, the advanced searching you need to do to support researchers in this area, uh, whether it was about uh, the ways that um, libraries are supporting researchers in this area. So whether it's workshops, individual consultations, library guides, um, how are we managing the demand for, for this kind of support. And another big theme was partnerships. So working with, uh, I guess, our, our customers, um, I guess demonstrating value to um, our customers and forming stronger links with them. Um, and that again is tied to systematic reviews. That's another area where you can form partnerships with researchers. Uh, there was so much else in the two days. It really was, for me, it was like a gold mine. Um, I can't cover it all, but uh, there were fascinating talks about building search filters, uh, about uh, how to systematically search grey literature, research data management, text mining, etc., uh, etc. Et my takeaways from the two days, uh, with regard to the profession, uh, and I'm talking about health librarians, um, I was a bit surprised to find that it was even more diverse than I thought um, before I went in. So there was a presentation by Tarina Solomon, who works uh, for the Joanna Briggs Institute. And essentially, she's just a contract librarian almost, like uh, kind of a uh, contract information specialist in a particular area, which is wound care research. Uh, the Flinders Filters group spoke, and there are obviously health librarians who spend their day building and validating search filters, which sounds fascinating. Uh, and again, from filters, there was a presentation, uh, it was by Jessica Tyndall, and she obviously spends a lot of her time searching grey literature. Uh, and she, as far as I can tell, is, is the expert on, on uh, advanced searching of grey literature and must spend a lot of her time doing that. So uh, I, find, I found that pretty fascinating. Uh, what I learned about myself, uh, the value of sharing information uh, kind of really came home over the two days because I took so much information away. Um, so I, I think I need to make more of an effort to share information in the future. Uh, the other major thing I, I figured out about myself is that I am working in the right profession. Um, I, I just was just so interested in everything that was presented and I have like pages and pages of notes. Uh, basically, I guess it's a good thing to find out that you know, you're in the right line of work. So health librarianship is, is where I should be, I think. Uh, what happens now for my role as a uh, faculty librarian, uh, as I mentioned, I've got a, a, a big list of, of things that I took away from the two days. And there are so many things that I can implement here at Bond University. Uh, just a few, just to give you a flavour. Uh, and again, a lot of it's around systematic review support. Uh, a couple of the unis use forms to guide um, researchers that approach the library for this kind of support. And I think that is a good idea that I, that I could implement. Basically means that um, time is saved and the process is more effective. Uh, so I'm looking at that. Uh, better support materials. I'm, I'm thinking about this idea of how can I um, meet this uh, increasing demand in, in a better way. Uh, and what I'm going to do is still up in the air. Uh, that could involve running more workshops. Um, could involve a library guide, possibly. And so much else, um, but one of the key things that came to mind was uh, libraries and academic libraries being advocates for best practice in research. So, you know, I, I could be playing a, a significant role in ensuring that bond researchers are adhering to guidelines, uh, research guidelines like Prisma and Consort, uh, I can be making those researchers aware of uh, software tools for text mining and, and other tools that might automate their process 
So uh, some of the things that I can implement. Uh, in terms of uh, library services itself here at Bond, uh, I'm essentially the, the lone health sciences librarian here. So basically any changes that I implement uh, directly um, improve the services that the library offers. So uh, there's that. Uh, but I also uh, will be transferring knowledge within my library. Um, and so, so the information I got from uh, this experience will spread uh, beyond just myself. And QLock's role in spreading the information, uh, this webinar is obviously doing that. I did think that because systematic review support is so on the increase, that there's scope for a, a webinar focused on that, uh, which would uh, best be kind of run uh, in conjunction with the QLock Research, Research Support Working Party. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm happy to be involved with investigating that. And lastly, other people have mentioned that, um, yeah, apply for the scholarship. Uh, the next round is open at the moment. And that ties into my last slide. Uh, this was on the class in the, 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 the medical students building. Uh, but it just kind of ties into that um, idea of seeking out what you don't know, basically. So if you, if you don't seek out new information, you'll never know. Um, so yeah. Apply for a QLock scholarship. That's me. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. That's a, a good plug for the, the scholarship program. Um, our last speaker today is Sarah Evans from UQ. Um, I, my apologies, I'm going to have to disappear now because I have another commitment, but Maureen is going to wrap up at the end and um, if people have got time to hang around and take questions then I'm sure Maureen will handle them ably. But in the meantime, it's your turn, Sarah. Hello, can you see everything? Yes. Fantastic. Well, hi everyone. I'm Sarah Evans. I'm from the University of Queensland Library. I will admit that currently I'm on a secondment to the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences in a slightly different role, but um, I managed to attend this course called Design Thinking for Service Delivery just before this secondment started. <coughs> Okay, the course. It was a QUT Business Connect Leadership Development Workshop on the 25th of July. It was held at Gardens Point campus of QUT. It was a class of about 38 people, which was almost to capacity. And most of my classmates came from state government or the Brisbane City Council. So you can see I'm really a fish out of, out of water. There were no librarians any, anywhere. Judy Matthews from the QUT Business School was the presenter for the entire day. Objectives of the course, how to view situations, how to apply a design mindset, and learning to build solutions based on design thinking and action, building skills and confidence, etc. I have 22 slides, but I will not go through every one of them. Um, we don't really have time for that, but you're welcome to have a look afterwards. What is design? Design is purposeful behavior. A designer often says there has to be a better way and having empathy is also quite useful. Who is a designer? Now apparently we are all designers whether we know it or not. Go beyond the obvious, what is the job to be done? That's the sort of question we need to be asking ourselves. I'll give you an example that we were given. We were shown quite a long YouTube clip, which I haven't included here. A consultant was talking about how he was asked to consult with a fast food chain in America. It was a small fast food chain, but they were doing very, very well in selling milkshakes. And they started out by surveying the customers saying, how can we make our milkshakes better? What else should we add? What new flavors? Should we increase the strength of ingredients? Those types of things. And there were really no conclusive um, results from, from that survey. So instead of going back to the drawing board, they just stood around the car park and watched customers go in and out of the store and drive in and out of the drive through And they started just having conversations with them, talking about the milkshake and the fast food chain itself. And what they discovered was the drivers of the cars in particular quite often told them that 
they were preparing for a long commute. They had a half hour drive to work and they thought they'd just get a milkshake. It gave something, you know, something for them to do on the commute. They'd have one hand on the steering wheel and the other hand on their milkshake. So the job to be done was not so much drinking a milkshake and getting nourishment from it. It was giving them something to do with a fidgety hand on the drive. So it's a completely different way of looking at a situation. How to build your creative confidence. We were shown a short clip um, spoken by David Kelly of the Stanford D School. It was a TED talk. And one of the case studies he illustrated was of a doctor in a hospital in America who observed a lot of small children who needed to have an MRI done but were terrified of the MRI machine. Now, if you've never been through one, they're very noisy, very loud. It would be quite a terrifying experience for a small child. Um, I can see that. So what they did was put the MRI machine in a room by itself and they decorated the room. So it was, I think, a pirate, a pirate island um, with ships and beaches and things like that. And they decorated the MRI machine and they created a story for children so that they, when they went into the room, they were part of that story and going through the MRI machine was part of the story as well. So it served the purpose of relaxing children to the extent that they no longer needed any anesthetics or any type of sedation to go and have an MRI done um, and made their parents enormously happy. So it was a different way of looking at a problem. The obvious solution is just to drug the child, but this is a much, a much nicer way to go about it. How do we come up with good ideas? We're shown a lengthy clip by DeWitt Jones, who is a photographer for National Geographic. He had an awful lot to say, I've got to say. Um, I've cherry picked a lot of his quotes. He would take hundreds and hundreds of photos and only one of them would usually make the story in National Geographic. He's obviously very passionate about what he does and he would you know, illustrate very clearly how you need to look at the ordinary and see the extraordinary and things like that. Okay, then we moved on in the session, what is design thinking with a textbook definition. I've highlighted the, the most um, useful takeaways there, but ultimately the end goal is to deliver solutions that address the real problem underneath it. When can we use design thinking? Pretty much all the time. Is the problem human-centered? How complex is it? What data do you have? Are you curious? Do you have influence? I have a nice grid which talks a little bit more in detail about questions you can ask. Visual representation with an explanation of the 10 tools. So you can see you visualize, you journey map, you can do an analysis, you can mind map, brainstorm, concept development, assumption testing, prototyping, customer co-creation, and learning launch. Steps to designing for growth. What is the job to be done? Job is shorthand for what an individual really seeks to accomplish in a given circumstance. Design attitude, abilities and capability. You need the ability to see the whole situation. You need passion for bringing ideas for life. Willing to take risks without fully knowing the outcome in advance. You need to be open to visualization and exploration of all the senses in seeking solutions. And you must be able to empathize with the human side of situations. One approach, this is a practical application. We were shown uh, another YouTube clip of how to make toast. Tom gathered a, a number of people together and asked them to draw how to make toast. Now he would have had, you know, dozens of different interpretations of how to make toast. And by looking at everyone's interpretations of how to make toast, you could eventually come down to um, distill it into, you know, something meaningful for, for a wider audience. It was a very interesting clip and I would certainly encourage you to have a look at it um, some other time.
design thinking and human-centered design. Reiterating, I'm just reiterating some of the information I've already presented. It's all about problem solving, putting people at the heart of the process. At the end of the session, at the end of the day, it was only a nine till four session. Uh, we were put into groups, small groups of three or four people, and we had to come up with ideas for the Red Cross to increase blood donations. So we took what we'd learned. There might have only been one or two things that resonated with us in all the different clips we were shown and the discussions we had. But in our small groups, we had to come up with ideas and we had to act them out. So if we were going to put on a, a TV commercial, how would, it, how would it look? How would it go? What would the story be? How would we get our message across? And you can see from my shorthand, there were eight very different ideas of how the Red Cross could sell the message that they need to increase blood donations. Certainly, as there was a group that thought, you know, you need to translate the message about the benefits of giving blood and translate it into multiple languages so it would reach um, all corners of your community. A train carriage setup, the idea there is that if you had say a six carriage train that runs from the outer suburbs to the city every day, make one carriage a blood donation carriage. So you've got all your commuters who are essentially a captive audience for their 30 to 60 minute commute. You let them travel in style in a train carriage and you take their blood. Um, someone else had the idea, they had the idea of getting a drone with Domino's pizza delivery, particularly for students. So you get your pizza and a blood kit where you could, you know, self-administer, put the blood donation back in the drone and then take it back to the pizza place. Another group had the idea about an app at the gym. So you'd capture a lot of uh, people in the prime of life, very healthy people, put something right next to the gym and uh, create an app to advertise. Sporting grounds with rewards programs. Again, you've got a captive audience. Point of death, as in when people die, say they're in a road accident, could that be the time when blood is connect collected? So a lot of people have on their driver's license that little symbol that represents they're happy to be an organ donor. If they donate their organs, why couldn't they donate their blood? That would be another way to go about it. GPS locators for truckies and other people who travel and having an Uber operation where the blood van comes to you individually. So, you know, between the 38 of us, we thought up some really broad ideas to communicate a message, very out of the box thinking. Key professional and personal takeaways, change your perspective, change your lens to see a problem a different way. That resonated with me particularly. Reframing, reframing a problem into an opportunity. Not everything is negative. There can be positive takeaways from a situation which might appear challenging at first. And go beyond the obvious. What is the job to be done? Thinking back to the milkshake, the milkshake wasn't about drinking the milkshake. It was about giving someone something to do on a long commute. My example here would be when students say they want more study space, they seem to always want more study space. The obvious solution is to shrink your print collection and add more student study carols. Less obvious would be to add more carols, but improve soundproofing, so increase the density. A less obvious solution as well would be just to build an outdoor area, add a heap more study space, larger capacity there. But an even less obvious solution would be to ask yourselves, do students really want study space or do they want a sense of place on campus? That's a bigger question. Um, but it's the sort of thing you might ask yourself, do they actually want to study or do they just want somewhere to go, somewhere to hang out, somewhere they can eat their lunch over reading Facebook, somewhere to meet their friends? It's, it's poss possibly a bigger, a bigger question than what we, think, what we think it is. Applications to my work for UQ Library and for QLock. Don't be disheartened if the answer isn't obvious. Often um, problems that crop up don't have an obvious solution and it's usually not immediate. Look beyond, beyond the regular solutions. Yes, there's a lot of regular solutions in libraries to different problems, but it's certainly worth taking a, a second glance at things. I think talking to people with different perspectives can certainly help reveal other sides of an issue that you might not see yourself. And ask yourself, can the solution come from the outside? Can you collaborate with another organisational unit, whether it's within your library or within the university as a whole, to come up with a workable solution? I have a bibliography, but essentially that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much to Sarah and to everyone.
I'm just bringing it back to here so that if we have any questions, we can talk about them here. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or you can um, put them into um, the chat window and we can monitor them there. I've also got just a screenshot here from the Professional Development Scholarship website for QLOC if anyone has any questions about the scholarship and filling it out for the next round. It is now available and it was closing on the 24th of November. Looks like there's some chats coming through. What do we have here? Thank you everyone. Very enjoyable. Fantastic. Thanks for everyone. Any other questions? All right, if there's nothing in the Q&A, no questions, any questions from the panelists, or should we wrap it up? Okay, thank you very much to everybody who presented, and we look forward to looking at the applications for the next Professional Development Scholarship Round.